Hi everyone, this is Nuclear Pep Talk and I'm Ksenia Dvernavska, your local guide into a nuclear world. Nuclear Pep Talk is a platform where we debunk myths and fears about everything nuclear, hopefully in simple terms and with remarkable experts. And today our episode is going to be dedicated to International Atomic Energy Agency safeguards. Well, I know it sounds difficult, but we have a wonderful guest who is going to walk us through all the difficult moments of that particular topic. And our special guest today is Noah Mayhew, my dear colleague and friend. He works as a Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation, and he's a research associate. He is also a commissioner on the trilateral trilateral blah blah blah. <laughs> He is also a commissioner of the Trilateral Jan Deep Cuts Commission. He's been writing a lot about non-proliferation, IA safeguards, the nexus between nuclear security and peaceful uses of uh, nuclear science and technology, US and Russia relations, and I'm sure you can find his work in Arms Control Today, the Non-Proliferation Review and Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. So make sure you Google him, I'm sure you'll find a lot of interesting things. He calls himself a resident safeguard nerd, but I call him a Duke of Safeguards. So Noah is going to talk us through safeguards, why do we need them, what they are, why they are important. And just to give you a little bit before you actually watch professional talking about it, I just want to tell you that safeguards actually help to make sure that nuclear activities or nuclear materials that states possess are not misused or diverted into military purposes. So it's really important, really important for everyone. Make sure you listen really carefully. So please welcome Noah Mayhew. By the way, just wanted to give you a little warning about a new thing that is going to appear in this podcast. As you know, we have a coffee break. And since the last episode, the coffee break is the time where I asked our guest a very personal question that is not the part of those 10 questions. Um, and we, you know, drink something like coffee or tea. Um, but I was thinking to introduce something more, not more, but just something useful for everyone. And it's going to be an opportunity break. And, you know, if by the time I edit the video, I haven't come up yet with a better name. It's going to be called opportunity break, but we'll see. <laughs> Um, during the opportunity break, somewhere in the middle of a podcast, I'm going to tell you about the cool opportunities for young leaders, for young professionals, for just general youth who are interested in non-proliferation, disarmament and arms control. Um, but, and I'm going to tell about those opportunities to you because I'm, because I know from my own experience that it's so important, so crucial to participate in those things. I've done myself, I've done a lot of them myself and I know how it's been, uh, useful for me as a non-proliferation and disarmament and arms control professional, the young professional. So I'm going to share some of them that I uh, really think they're going to be useful to you uh, somewhere in the middle of the podcast. So, so stay tuned. <laughs> okay, Noah, so thank you for being with us today. Thank you for joining us in the fourth episode of our nuclear pep talk about safeguards. And without further ado, first question to you. What is IAEA? Yeah, so the IAEA, or International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, is an international organization. It was founded in 1957, and the mandate of the IAEA is to facilitate the spread of nuclear technology across the globe for peaceful purposes. This is everything from nuclear power to nuclear technology that helps improve agriculture, cancer diagnosis and treatment, uh, food, medical, and industrial sterilization, and, and other applications. There are many. Uh, the IAEA also has the mandate to apply what are called safeguards, which is what I spend a lot of my time thinking about. Um, in addition to peaceful uses and safeguards, the IAEA also provides member states um, guidance on a number of issues, including nuclear safety and security, uh, nuclear infrastructure development, and nuclear legislation, and other topics like uh, emergency response. And you already touched up on that. So what are the safeguards? <clears throat> yeah, so safeguards are to be understood as technical measures that the IAEA implements in agreement with the states that are concerned. Uh, and safeguards are meant to provide credible assurance that nuclear, nuclear technology is not, further, uh, not used to further any military purpose. So you can think of safeguards like a ledger, 
right, where safeguards agree to report their holdings of nuclear material. That's defined in this document, the statue, as uranium, plutonium, and thorium. And they also report design information about the nuclear facilities they have in the territory. Um, the state agrees for the IEA to verify these reports through things like inspections. Um, there are three kinds of information the IEA uses to make conclusions about safeguards for a given state. That is information that's provided by the state. This is things like I am the state, I'm telling you, IAEA, I have this many amounts of nuclear material. There's also uh, information garnered from IAEA activities. This is from the inspections, things like environmental sampling and other stuff. Uh, and then finally, there's open source information uh, that the IAEA is able to get by just Google, basically. Uh, the first two categories make up the vast majority of information that the IAEA uses to uh, do safeguards. Um, though occasionally open source information has come in uh, handy. Why do we need uh, safeguards? So yeah, that's a good question. And I think it's best summed up using this sort of model that Laura Rockwood, who was in the IAEA's Department of Legal Affairs for 28 years, and she's informally known as the queen of safeguards. She says that they, safeguards have evolved over the years as a function of state's security needs and state's perceptions of risks there too. So what does that mean? That means we need safeguards because they give us confidence or credible assurance in the IEA parlance uh, that other countries are not using their nuclear technology to further military purposes, not to make weapons, right? Uh, different kinds of safeguards agreements are designed to, diff to address different concerns of states, but at their core, safeguards are meant to provide confidence to the international community, and maybe that's a neighboring country, maybe that's um, countries that are further away but are strategically significant uh, for another country, that nuclear weapons are not on the table. Um, it, it's important to note that safeguards are not designed to prevent illicit nuclear activity as such. Rather, safeguards are designed to detect the diversion of nuclear material, which is meant to be declared to the IAEA, and to detect the presence of undeclared nuclear material or activities, so to say. Everything is supposed to be kosher. Can you give us a little bit of a historical background? How and when the safeguard system was established? Yeah, so since the beginning of the nuclear era, it was understood by people who were involved that nuclear technology, which we had seen in such a monstrous form vis-a-vis -vis the atomic bombings of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, but that it could also be used for the betterment of humankind. And so we need to use nuclear technology for the good things, but establish some kind of system to prevent the bad things. Uh, the idea of safeguards didn't actually start with the IAEA. Uh, the, the very first United Nations General Assembly resolution in 1946 actually had to do with the establishment of an Atomic Energy Commission, and it noted that the committee should make specific proposals for effective safeguards. So in the really early days, safeguards were applied bilaterally. Uh, this is, so to say, by a supplier state uh, to a recipient state. Um, after the speech of the now very famous speech from US President uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower, that's called Adams for, for Peace, the IAEA was founded, this is in 1957, and it became the IAEA's role to implement safeguards. And again, usually at the beginning, this was at the insistence of a state that is supplying nuclear technology to another country uh, or material. Uh, interestingly, it wasn't actually initially clear what the nature of the IAEA's role would be, what would be IAEA safeguards. Uh, before the statute, again, this document, was adopted, uh, some saw the future of the IAEA as sort of a pool or like a bank of nuclear material, uh, or even maybe like a broker for nuclear material. Um, and then others saw the IAEA's role as a sort of as a promoter of Atoms for Peace, it's their slogan, now peace and development, mm -hmm. so to say peaceful uses, right? So what the IAEA became is really close to the latter, a promoter of peaceful uh, nuclear uses. Uh, there was agreement that in order to support either of these goals, that there would have to be a system of safeguards in place to ensure that the material and activities um, remained in peaceful uses. So for this purpose, the IAEA includes uh, an article that establishes the IAEA's mandate to uh, apply safeguards, uh, and I'm quoting here, with respect to any agency project or other arrangement requested by the uh, parties concerned, so to say, a safeguards agreement. So. 
So as I promised in the beginning, now we're going to have an opportunity break. And in the opportunity break today, I'm going to tell you about two wonderful and mesmerizing opportunities. The first opportunity is Young Women Next Generation Initiative, organized by the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation. This is a mentorship program where you, as a participant, will be connected with a mentor who's going to be a non-proliferation disarmament and arms control high-level specialist, and you're going to work together. You're going to do something together for one year. So it's really amazing opportunity for young ladies. So this is specifically for young women. And um, this is the time for us girls to rule the world. So don't hesitate to apply. And another opportunity I want to mention is Southeast Asia and Pacific Online Educational Course organized by the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization Youth Group, or particularly the organization and the youth group. And, well, I have to say that I have a little bit of personal thing to it, because uh, together with the cluster of the coordination team of the CTB2 Youth Group, where I am the coordinator, we've initially designed this course, and then I was developing during my, I, I was developing, developing it during my internship at the CTBTO, and now it's finally alive and waiting for the applications. So if you come from Southeast Asia and Pacific, you want to know more about nuclear test ban, about the organization, about why it matters to you within this region, because it is really important. So make sure you apply. And I will leave all the links down below. I'm not going to tell you about the deadlines and links here because that's easy if you find them down below. Click on it, look everything for yourself, what you need to do, what kind of documents you need to gather, what you should do to be eligible or to apply. So make sure you click those links and check this out because these are opportunities you cannot miss. <clears throat> And of course, she forgot to tell you, the open now internship call is still open. So make sure you go and check because, you know, spending six months in Mexico sounds like a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to the next question. So what kind of safeguards agreements exist? Because I know there are many. So can you give us a gist of it? So yeah, sure. So... After the IAEA was founded, the, the safeguards that it implemented were primarily what are called now what are now called item-specific safeguards agreements. As the name would suggest, these kind of agreements apply only to the material and the facilities that are specified in that one agreement. So remember the model that I mentioned a moment ago about state security and perceived risks there too. In the early days, the perceived risk was the misuse of supplied nuclear technology, and so the supplier state would insist, as a condition of the supply of a nuclear facility or something, that countries would conclude these safeguards agreements on the supplied facilities, the materials, and any material that is produced as a result of them. So, later, along comes the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, in part as a result that the threat perception changed. Now we're worried about the misuse of a domestic nuclear fuel cycle, what, is, what is a state is able to do by itself. So that's why the NPT contains language that safeguards should be applied on all source or special fissionable material, which again, those are definitions in the IEA statute. Um, all of that special uh, source or special fissionable material in a country under its jurisdiction or under its control anywhere. That is a fancy way of saying all of it. So that language was lifted right from the NPT and used in a document called IMCIRC 153. IMCIRC stands for Information Circular. That is this guy. Mm -hmm. um, and that document informs what, what are called comprehensive safeguards agreements should look like. They've also been called full scope safeguards agreements, but once again, the point is all the nuclear material. So most countries today have one of these safeguards agreements in force. Um, the question becomes, what are you supposed to do if you have comprehensive safeguards agreements? Well, in basic terms, you tell the IAEA about all the nuclear material you have, as well as all the nuclear facilities, and the IAEA will come and verify that that information is correct, what you're telling them is true, and they'll do this by way of inspections. So shortly after IMCIRC 153 was approved by the Board of Governors, they, and so to say the IAEA and its member states, realized that it may not make sense to come to countries with little or no nuclear material and no nuclear facilities at the frequency that they might come to a state with a larger nuclear fuel cycle. 
And this is the genesis of what are called small quantities protocol, uh, which, as the name would suggest, are protocols to safeguards agreements. They're not standalone documents. So if you've got one of these protocols, um, a lot of the inspection and reporting requirements under your safeguards agreement are suspended, or in IAEA speak, they are held in abeyance. So in 2005, the Board of Governors, again, this is the IAEA sort of main governing body, uh, realized that this protocol was a little too easy to qualify for. Uh, it suspended too many requirements under the safeguards agreement. And so they approved a revised text for small quantities protocols to try to fix that. Uh, because the IEA doesn't have a, really a mechanism to make states accept the new text, most states, um, were, rather all states with small quantities protocols were sent a letter. And as a result, most of them have either amended their protocols to the new text uh, or rescinded it in cases where they wouldn't qualify anymore. Uh, as of April of this year, I believe 26 countries still have the old small quantities protocol. And this is something that the IEA's chief, uh, Director General of Rafael Mariano Grossi, is still working on. And then, of course, we have what are called um, additional protocols, which I think we're going to talk about in just a minute. <laughs> yes, right. So can you tell us what is an additional protocol and what's the whole fuss about it? Yeah, so at the AP, um, let's, let's recall again this, this risk assessment model that, that Laura Rockwood came up with. In the 1990s, the international community discovers that Iraq has developed a secret nuclear weapons program, and it's disguised quite literally underneath a peaceful nuclear program. So if we remember that item-specific safeguards were about preventing the misuse of supplied items, and comprehensive safeguards were about preventing the misuse of a domestic nuclear fuel cycle, the risk perception now becomes undeclared nuclear material and activities. So to say, things that the state was supposed to tell the IAEA about, but didn't. So what to do when we realize that state's declarations might be correct, but they're not complete? So this risk perception was compounded when, um, further after Iraq, when uh, inspections in North Korea gave results that, again, indicated that they had been hiding something. In the case of North Korea, it's the, it was undeclared reprocessing um, in order to get plutonium. Um, the IEA and member states <clears throat> worked on this problem for the better part of the 1990s, and they came to the conclusion that there were some things that they could do under existing legal authority, so to say, with uh, comprehensive safeguards agreements, but there were some things that the Secretariat of the IEA recommended would benefit from additional legal authority. So that process ended up with a document called the Model Additional Protocol, um, and it's spelled out in this document, IMSERC 540. Uh, additional protocols, they are voluntary measures. Uh, it's also a protocol to a safeguards agreement, not a separate document, or so does it, not a separate agreement, I should say. Um, and additional protocols give the IEA more tools to provide credible assurance, and in safeguards speak, you'll hear credible assurance, that term a lot. Um, credible assurance about the absence of undeclared nuclear material or activities in a country. And I'll say this again, an additional protocol, it is voluntary. However, if you ask me, a comprehensive safeguards agreement with an additional protocol is and should be the de facto modern standard for safeguards in uh, non-nuclear weapon states. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> it was just funny because I think we were like, okay, you know, hesitating. Okay, so, uh, 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 yeah, like we can do it like that. <laughs> okay, so now for just for coffee break, can you tell us a little bit why you're doing safeguards? Why are you interested in the topic and why and how have you become the nerd of safeguards? Uh, like most of the good things that have happened in my life, uh, pure dumb luck. Um, I ended up in Vienna four and a half years ago for an internship at the International Atomic Energy Agency. Uh, I was hired at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation right afterwards. Uh, and uh, at that time, the Queen of Safeguards was still the executive director here, and she involved me in a project and uh, on safeguards. And the more I studied, the more I realized I didn't know, and the more I knew I needed to know. Uh, safeguards is one of those topics that you can know just a little bit on the surface and it's helpful, but the sort of deeper you go, the more 
you realize there are even further depths to go through and uh, I am nothing if not a perfectionist. Wonderful. And uh, to those who doesn't know, the queen of safeguards is Laura Rockwood. So I think we, Noah has given many shout outs to her during this podcast. <laughs> So go. Uh, I'll leave the. I leave her uh, Twitter uh, account in the description down below, so you can also check her out. Great. And can you tell us um, more in detail? Because you already mentioned that. How does IEA verify the compliance? What are the tools? And can you ex expand on them a little bit? Sure. So the IEA verifies compliance with safeguards agreements through a few different methods. Uh, the first is access, and this means inspections, this means verifying the design information that a state is supposed to provide of different nuclear facilities in a state, um, and for states that have additional protocols, um, there is an enhanced kind of verification activity that is called complementary access. So during inspections, the IEA goes to facilities, as well as locations outside facilities where nuclear material is, is customarily used, and they do checks. They attach seals to make sure that things are not accessed that shouldn't be accessed. They check cameras that are uh, locked into the facilities that only are accessible to the inspectors. They take environmental samples to analyze back at headquarters here in Vienna, as well as uh, at a network of analytical laboratories. Uh, they take small samples of material uh, in, from facilities back for what is called destructive analysis. The analysis destroys the sample. And then you do measurements on material, and that's called non-destructive analysis or non-destructive assay. Uh, and then they do some other stuff. Uh, at the end of the day, if measurements and other inspection activities square with what a state is telling the IEA is happening, everybody's happy. Uh, since the dawn of the information age, though, we have a third category of information, and that's, as I mentioned a moment ago, that is open source information. Now, I'll emphasize again, this actually makes up the smallest amount of information that the IEA uses to draw conclusions about safeguards for a state. But it can be an important indicator of things that the IEA might wish to follow up on. So for example, one, <clears throat> one thing scientists really like to do is publish papers. If a scientist is publishing studies using nuclear material and the state didn't say that it had any nuclear material in the facility where that scientist works, the IAEA is going to want to know what's going on there, right? That does not mean that the state is necessarily trying to hide something. Uh, when these kind of things happen, it's most commonly, I will call it a clerical error. It's usually corrected pretty quickly um, and frankly is not a big deal. Now, here's an important moment to note as well that, <clears throat> pardon me, that the IAEA does not come and like break down the country's door in cases where it looks like something has not been declared that should have been. They follow up with questions for clarification, and usually that just resolves it. Now, if you've got a state like North Korea, you do a number of follow-ups, including additional inspections, and you do this hoping to resolve the anomalies. In the case of North Korea, as we know, the IEA did a number of these follow-up inspections, I think at least five, um, and the Director General eventually reported the matter to the IAEA's Board of Governors and later to the United Nations Security Council. Thankfully, that's an extreme example. Most of the time, it doesn't come to that. Good that North Korea is quite a unique case study, I guess, in, in terms of safeguards. Uh, and Indeed. hopefully, it, st it stays the same. You already talked a little bit about inspections. I know that there are different types of inspections. Can you tell what are the existing types of, say, of IEA inspections? Sure. So I, I would sooner talk about what kind of verification activities are carried out and frame it that way. Uh, there are inspections, and as you note, that there, there are a few kinds of those. There are what are called ad hoc inspections. Uh, generally, that's what's done when a state has concluded its safeguards agreement in the IEA goes in to verify that everything that the state says it has is in fact true, so to say correct and complete uh, in terms of the declarations. Um, as the name would suggest, an ad hoc inspection can take place under other circumstances. It is, after all, ad hoc. Uh, there are routine inspections that take place at regular predetermined intervals that are discussed between the IAEA and the state. Um, this is the, the sort of safeguards bread and butter, right? It's what you would expect when you think of safeguards. Um, 
And then there are, are what are called special inspections, which are meant to be used in cases where the information provided by the state is not enough for the IAEA to fill its responsibilities under the safeguards agreement. Safeguards agreements are treaties under international law, so the IAEA has got the responsibility as much as the member state. Uh, unfortunately, special inspections have become really, really politicized over the years, um, and they've become viewed as a sign that a state is up to no good. Um, and they, I don't really think they should be viewed that way, but um, uh, you know that's a longer, it's a longer conversation. Um, so yes, that's inspections. As I mentioned a minute ago, in addition to inspections, there is design information verification. You go in and verify the design information that the state has provided to you. And for states with additional protocols in force, that's complementary access, so-called, because it complements the kind of access the IAEA already has. They can go to more places and um, talk to more people, basically. I think one of the questions that bothers me sometimes, I'm thinking, why would a state actually conclude safeguards agreement and would allow IEA to, you know, inspect their areas to have, con not have control over, but at least have control of the knowledge, you know, what kind of nuclear materials are there? Why would states do that? Well, so you hit the nail right on the head, actually. It's not about control. The IAEA is not the world police. The IAEA um, has a very clear mandate to spread nuclear technology um, and to apply safeguards to, and again, this is IAEA parlance, but provide credible assurance that military nuclear technology, or rather that nuclear material and technology are not used to further any military purpose. Why would a state do this? So let's return to the model about state security needs and perceived risks thereto. The safeguard system, or rather I think ecosystem is more accurate, um, as safeguards, they, they, it's many different things, right? It's not just one mechanism, is effective why? Because after the NPT, the vast majority of non-nuclear weapon states concluded comprehensive safeguards agreements, and many of them, most of them, later additional protocols. It works because most countries find it in their interest to provide this credible assurance that peaceful nuclear technology in their countries remains peaceful and to support the IAEA in providing that assurance. So basically, when most countries are willing to provide that assurance, the international community at large can rest easier in the knowledge that basically nobody is up to anything. It, think of it like going through security at the airport. One would generally assume that nobody has anything to hide in their carry-on baggage, but it's in everyone's interest to go, secure, to go through security so that we all know that the baggage has toothpaste and clothing rather than, say, plutonium. So, no, the last question to you, what are the challenges to safeguard system and how the IA addresses them? Yeah, so, I mean, safeguards are not meant to be stagnant, right? <clears throat> safeguards uh, evolve as, again, as a function of uh, state security needs and risks there too, and those things are going to continue to evolve. Uh, so I would say one of the challenges to the safeguard system is ensuring that it keeps pace with uh, state's current security needs and their perceived risks there too. Uh, there are a lot of ways in which uh, not just the IAEA itself, but also its member states are trying to, to keep up with these, these needs. This involves a lot of different emerging technologies, uh, things such as how do we make the best use of uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence or robotics or distributed ledger technology uh, to ensure that the safeguards, I, I should re repeat the, the phrase ecosystem really rather than system, is as effective and efficient as possible. Um, another challenge I would say, and this is connected, is the budget. Uh, the IAEA, like all UN organizations, works on a budget that is approved by its member states. Uh, the IAEA has actually got some advantage in this regard. Uh, the IAEA works on what is called a zero real growth budget, meaning that the budget increases from year to year to account for inflation, but does not increase in real terms, so to say they don't get more money. Um, whereas most human organizations work on a zero nominal growth budget, meaning no increases at all, make it work. So particularly since the advent of uh, the model additional protocol, um, the IEA has been working to integrate safeguards measures available under comprehensive safeguards agreements and additional protocols 
not just to make them more efficient, uh, effective safeguards, but to basically do the same thing for less money. Uh, but as the amount of nuclear facilities around the world and uh, locations outside of facilities that the IEA is responsible for safeguarding, as that number goes up, the budget stays the same. And eventually we're going to reach a head where as efficient as the IEA wants safeguards to be, they're just going to need more money. And so that's a challenge on, on the horizon as well. But this is one of the reasons that the IAEA is putting so much uh, stock into how emerging technologies can be used to improve safeguards. The last one that I'll say is that, and again, this is on the same vein, uh, since the 1990s, as the IAEA has been integrating different measures under uh, comprehensive safeguards agreements and additional protocols, the IAEA realized, even back in the 1990s, that it really makes the most sense to focus on the state as a whole when you look at safeguards. So to say, don't just do what is critically been called box checking um, at individual facilities, but really look at all the information about a given state, uh, all of the safeguards, relevant information about a state when planning for implementing and evaluating safeguards for that state. And over time, this became known as the state level concept. Now, the IAEA has worked very hard to make the process uh, under the state level concept for planning, implementing, and evaluating safeguards a consistent one and one that is understandable to the member states. Uh, but that work continues as well. And uh, I think that looking into the future, um, sort of making the most out of the state level concept is, is where we're going. Thank you, Noah, for being with us here today. I think safeguards is a really difficult topic, and I think you really have done a good job explaining the nuts and bolts of safeguards. Thank you very much for that. You're entirely welcome. It's my pleasure. Yeah, and uh, I hope to see you more uh, on the Nuclear Pep Talk. And for those who've been watching, thank you for watching. And remember, fear is here. Learn about nuclear. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone for watching. I hope you're becoming more and more nerdy in this nuclear stuff. And if you like this video, please press the like button, subscribe if you want to see more because I upload every two weeks. And the treat, the nuclear treat of the day, which is a nuclear acronym of the day, is IAEA. We've talked a lot about IAEA already, even in the previous in the, even in the previous episode. But I think it deserves its own nuclear acronym of the day. So, IAA, International Atomic Energy Agency. Well, we know how she explains things, so I'm sure I'll do a little bit better job. So, IAA, International Atomic Energy Agency, was established in 1957 as an independent international organization that promotes the peaceful uses of nuclear energy and helps to make sure that nuclear material and nuclear activity in the states are not diverted or somehow misused. For example, for military purposes. That's why IA sometimes is called United Nations Watchdog. And I just told you that it was established as an independent from United Nations international organizations. Why, it is, why is it a UN watchdog? Well, because it reports to United Nations General Assembly and United Nations Security Council. And apart from their main job, they are also promoting the peaceful use of nuclear energy and technology and science. So they have various programs like Zoonotic Disease Integrated Action, or a program of action for cancer therapy, or human health program, or IA water availability enhancement project. So they're not only about reactors, energy, they're also about other uses of nuclear science and technology, which is really exciting. And if you're a young scholar, you can definitely intern with them for one year, and this is a paid internship, so make sure you check that out. On that note, I want to say... <sighs> I hope I didn't miss anything and she didn't scare you, but I'm sure she explained you well what it is IAEA, so you know, right? So on that note, I want to say bye and see you in the next episode. Bye!